I'm going to start by recalling what I was saying in what I was saying on Monday. So um, we're talking now about polynomials with integer coefficients uh, starting Monday. Before everything we said was about field coefficients. Um, so the question is, what what can we extrapolate? And the main thing we proved on Monday was that if you take any polynomial with rational coefficients, uh, you have a special way of writing it, which is uh, which is this this way. So essentially, you pull out you pull out an a scalar uh, to the front, so everything here is an integer. You pull out uh, a scalar to the front. Uh, of course, if this is a fraction, I can always write it with with numbers that are co-prime that have no common factor. And what's left, you have some polynomial, and the coefficients are whole numbers, and they also have no common factor. And that's uh, the main tool to to show what I want to show today, which is that if you have a polynomial that is irreducible over the integers, it is also reducible over the rationals. We decided on Monday that going the other way around was, was very easy. If you're reducible over the integers, if you're a product of two polynomials of smaller degree, then automatically the same thing happens over the rationals because every polynomial with whole number coefficients is also a polynomial with rational coefficients. The other way, is not so clear if you if you're a product of two polynomials that have fractions in there, can you somehow clear the fact fractions to to ensure that you're a product of two integer polynomials? Uh, the answer is yes, but it's not clear at all. And since this is called Gauss's lemma, I'm guessing this is nobody realized this until the 19th century. Um, Okay, so um, I should warn you uh, that I'm I'm mostly so as you probably noticed I'm mostly following the book, but the book is kind of I mean I think the book made a mistake here. Um, so this is where we are. This is Gauss's lemma. If in case you're following and you get confused, Gauss's lemma is assuming that the polynomials are monic, um, which is not necessary. I think. Uh, our boy Justin just wants to make his life easier. Um, if you if you look for Gauss's lemma, there's another version. The good version is in chapter 18, where they well, it doesn't. We'll, we'll get there, but it doesn't say anything about being monic. The problem is so so. Really, this is true for any polynomial uh, with no restriction on it being monic. The thing is, if you if you look here, it uses Gauss's lemma in general, and I think this is just some oversight. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm essentially telling you stuff from chapter 18 today. Uh, okay, uh, there's four people here, right? So I wanted to make an announcement. Um, and I'm going to make it to the four people who are here. I guess I'll have to send an email later. So, um, so Professor Oxley came to watch the class on Monday, and he gave me some good advice. He told me that to encourage participation, one thing I could do was give free grades, and I, I thought it was a good idea. So, uh, from now on, uh, if you answer so. If you answer something in class, uh, you get a bonus points. And for every three points you get, you get 1%, just free 1% more in your grade. Uh, there's like 30, there's like 30 classes. So, you, um, I'm, so, all right, so I want everyone to participate. My goal is to not give the person who participates the most, like 10 points every class or the fastest and have everyone be quiet. So to prevent that, I'm, I'm trying to prevent that by giving you only one point per class and making it worth a lot. 
So if you, you know, you already got a point, that doesn't, you can still participate. Um, you just won't get it, it will just be a free contribution. Uh, there's like 30 classes left. So this is, um, you have 30 classes left. So this could be like 10% of your grade that you can get for free if you participate in every class. Hopefully that will also encourage you to come. Um, so you have to answer correctly. Uh, no, but I mean, if you answer, I guess it's gonna be subjective. I can see myself giving you the points if you answer incorrectly. Or maybe, maybe if you say like, two wrong but brave things, I will give you the points anyway. Um, you know, if you say two things that are half right. Also, if you ask a good question, I, I'm happy to give you a point. Um, okay. Um, if you find a mistake that I make, for sure that's the point, whether I make it on purpose or not. Uh, so yeah, now, you have something to gain from me here. Hopefully this, I just, I just don't want my class to be a YouTube video. I want it to be a discussion and I'm not sure how to do that. <clears throat> All right, so polynomials. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, so this is the, this decomposition is the key of everything. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a name. If, so I'm gonna say, if we have a polynomial, uh, with integer coefficients and, and there's no greatest common divisor. Welcome Tiago. Um, you missed an important announcement. So if I were you, I would watch the video later. Uh, if the, if there's no common factor in the coefficients and the coefficients are whole numbers, I'm gonna say that the polynomial is primitive. It's just gonna be a, a useful notion. And if, if I can write a polynomial, so if I have, if I have a polynomial with rational coefficients and I write it like in, in Monday's lemma, but now I'm saying F1 is primitive. Um, I will say that uh, this number that I, pull, I have to pull out to make it primitive, I'm going to call it the content. Uh, the content of, of the polynomial. And I will write, um, I would say that this number is C of F, C for content. <clears throat> so, um, okay, so every time, every time you, you have a polynomial with rational coefficients, you pull up this number and you're left, you pull out a number, you're left with a, a primitive polynomial. And I'm, I'm calling this the content. And if the content is one, um, um, uh, then F is gonna be primitive.
So if with two Fs, in case you've never seen it, means if and a leaf, it means the implication goes both ways. If F is primitive, then the content is one. If the content is one, then it's primitive. Um, if the content is one, that means I can, so let me write, write that carefully. If the content of F is one, um, then F F is the product of one times something primitive. Uh, so F is primitive. Um, and if F is primitive, then I can go the other way. Because, well, the content is what you need to multiply to make your polynomial primitive. So maybe I should, I will rewrite this formula. So what I'm saying is take any polynomial, it's the product of a rational number times something primitive. <clears throat> so, um, if I don't need to multiply by anything to make it primitive, that means you're already primitive. If you're already primitive, I don't need to multiply by anything. Okay, so um, So how do you compute the content? Um, so basically, I, I showed this on Monday, but let me go through it again. Let me do an example. Uh, so what is um, basically two steps? Um, the steps are clear the denominators that you have in the in your polynomial. And second step is pull out uh, the GCD of the coefficients. And whatever you have left is the content. So, let's see. <clears throat> So what is the content of this polynomial? <clears throat> Two thirds. Would it be six X plus X plus 12? Six x plus x plus twelve. Uh, Multiplying by three, and then they're all divisible by two. So you divide by two. I think that's what you get. I didn't check. Let's see. I don't know. Uh, Mason said uh, six, right? Uh, two thirds. Sorry. Cool. Uh, Mason said yeah. two thirds. I think it's two thirds. And I think probably what you have left over. Let's see. Uh, it's two thirds, and then what's left is that correct. Uh, six x squared plus x plus twelve, but it's not the content. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. So let's do what I just said. Clear the denominators. So step one: pull out a third. You tell twelve twelve x squared plus two x plus twenty four. Step two, clear the common factor. Common factor is clearly two for all those numbers. So the content is indeed two thirds. 
and the primitive polynomial that's left over is the one that Tiago said. All right. Uh, all right, good job. I'm gonna go with, you will get a bonus point. Um, probably should have gotten a piece of paper for this, you and I. There you go. Awesome. Okay. Um, all right. So um, one question, I think one question we should definitely answer is I, I said you can write this. Um, you can you can write it in this way. There's such a thing called the content, but um, I should prove that the content is unique. Could it could it be? Uh, could it be that you can find the content? I mean, I gave you an algorithm, but could it be that in some other way you rewrite, you rewrite it to get uh, something different? And the answer is uh, not really. So, but we have to prove it. The content is well defined up to a sign. Okay, right. so um, what I have to prove let f be a rational, well, no, no, be rational coefficients. Um, I have to prove that if f uh, can be factored in s in this way with, uh, maybe let's just call them all these rat just some rational number, Q1, Q2, rational numbers, F1, F2, uh, primitive. So imagine I could, I could find the content in two ways. I, I'm claiming that the content is Q1 and Q2. This must mean that Q1 is plus minus Q2. I could always stick a minus sign in there. That's just that's just life. <clears throat> so um, so suppose that this happens. So there's two basically. I mean, basically, there's one hypothesis here. I have two rational numbers, and and they're both primitive, uh, and the polynomials that are next to them are primitive. So clearly in this equation, I should say, I should divide by Q1. So, so let's write this rational number uh, as a fraction with uh, integer coefficients. And, and let's say they're mutually prime. So write it in, in lowest terms. So I want to show that they're both plus minus one. So um, what can I do? So I'm gonna give you a hint. Um, I, I have to start with the denominator. So F1 is C divided by D 
times F2. Um, how can I be sure that D is plus minus one? What is this equation telling me? Can you go off that uh, F1 and F2 are primitive? Uh, surely, because that's the only that's the only hypothesis I have. So the fact that they're primitive means two things. It means uh, it means that the coefficients are whole numbers and that they're uh, prime. So they're mutually prime. They have no common factor. Is that an H? Uh, ooh, I don't know which one you mean, but they're all Fs. Uh, um, for number for part one. It's probably the element? Z. The, uh, ooh, that's a Z, sorry. <clears throat> so you have um, you have two polynomials there with integer coefficients and their and there's and they have no common factor. So you have that f two um, when you well when you multiply by this by this stuff uh, still have has integer coefficients. So what does this mean? There's no integer D besides one that could divide all the coefficients to where they're all in the integers since the greatest common divisor of all of them is one, right? Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly right, Tiago. Um, so the thing is, I have a polynomial. I multiply by, so F2 has integer coefficients. I multiply by a number, and then I divide by something, and they all stay integers. Uh, so this means, um, so let's see. If I write f2 equal, equals oh, equals this, then c divided by d times f2 is is the same thing with uh, with that product in there. But what I know is that they're all integers. Uh, and how could that be? Well, D has to, D must divide C times A I for all I. And now since G C D since the since C and D are mutually prime, uh, D has I mean you factor them and all the factors of D have to be in not in C. So D must divide A I for all I. Um, so D must be plus minus one because we said that all these coefficients have no common factor. Okay, so so far we've shown that this denominator is, is not really there. It's a it's a one or a minus one. Any questions?
Okay, so let's see. Um, so we have F1 was a multiple of F2, but we really, we know that D is plus minus one. So F1 is just a multiple. Um, by an integer of F2. And we also know F1 and F2 are primitive. So I would like to show that C is plus minus one based on this. Um, how do I do this? So what I used in the previous slide was that F2 is primitive. I used that nothing divides every coefficient of F2. I haven't yet used that nothing divides every coefficient of F1. If you move the C over to the other side, the equation should still hold, right? With all integer coefficients, which would that force C to be one? Or plus minus one. Yeah, I don't need to. I don't even need to move it to the other side, really. Um, just from this equation, uh, c divides every coefficient of of f one. Because I have that f one is something like this. So every coefficient gets multiplied by, by C. And since F1 is primitive, um, C must be plus minus one. And now we're done because um, if you look back, C over D, so let me just rewrite what we had in the previous slide. I, was, I had written the polynomial in two different ways. And it said that C over D was Q1 divided by Q2. But I showed that C over D is plus minus one. So Q1 is plus minus Q2, which is what I wanted to prove. That there's really, the content makes sense. Um, it's well, it, it, you can't have two different answers unless one is minus the other. All right, any questions? I have a feeling that when I say any questions, you're not thinking of questions, you're just copying what I'm write, writing. So let me remind you that all these notes are they're up there in the cloud and you have the link on Moodle um, to just access them whenever you want. And also you have a book, which is just this, but better written. <clears throat> okay. So, um, one thing that is uh, that we should notice, um, remark is that the content of a polynomial is an integer if and only if the polynomial itself has integer coefficients. And I guess to prove it, um, if the content is an integer, I know that f equals the content times something primitive. Mm. 
by definition of the content, uh, which, well, it's primitive implies that you have integer coefficients by definition. So you multiply a number, a whole number by something, by a, a, an integer polynomial, you're gonna have something with integer coefficients. Um, so this is one way. Going the other if the polynomial has integer coefficients, uh, then what I can do is write f of x as well as before, it's always the content um time well. Why should I write this? What is the content if I have integer coefficients? It's at least guaranteed to be rational. Right. Roy? Oh, I was going to say integers. Say that again? I was going to say they're integers, but... They're integers. Uh, but how would you find it? For example, if f was... So something with integer coefficients. There were two steps to finding the... To finding the... Um, the content before. You pull out the GCD. Because there are, there's no denominators. This. It's just a GCD. So before I said you clear denominators and then you take the GCD. Uh, I don't have denominators to clear. So, so I only need to take the GCD, which is going to be an integer. All right, uh, sensor gets the bonus points. So, okay. Uh, let me just write that down. Then take C to be the GCD of the coefficients. F is going to be C times F1, and F1 will be primitive. So the GCD of the coefficients is indeed the content uh, of the polynomial. The one is primitive because if I take the coefficients and divide by the common factor, there's no common factor left. So this is this is super useful. Um, and I don't know, it's, it doesn't feel like we're doing much, but we are. Um, I don't know how to express this. Um, it feels it feels like you could take some polynomial with like strange rational coefficients there and somehow get the content to be an an integer an integer by sort of stuff canceling, but you just don't. Okay. Um, any questions? So um, the content has two key properties, uh, which um, give you everything you could ever want. So the first one is that um, the product of primitive polynomials is primitive. And the second one is that the, the content of the product is the product of the contents. And maybe you can see how from here, 
that we can get everything we want. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, prove one and use two to prove the other. So one is really a particular case of two, but uh, we're going to go the other way around the, because what I'm saying is if the, if the content of two polynomials is one, when I multiply them, the content is still one. Um, yeah, so one is a particular case of two, but one is the key step in proving two. So I'm going to prove one first. So suppose, yeah. Uh, does that mean that the content in general is, is it homomorphic then? The content uh, yeah. is a homomorphic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, when we do so, I mean, you have to be careful because um, this looks, it looks like a homomorphism, but it's a group homomorphism uh, because it does nothing with addition. The content of the sum, who knows? It's like the GCD of the sum. Uh, if you think of, of the content as a map from here, not zero, with the product to the rationals with the product, this preserves um, times. So it's a homomorphism. So why am I putting homomorphism? Because I don't think it's a homomorphism of anything you've ever seen. So here's a question for you. Um, why, why am I not saying that it's a homomorphism exactly? I think didn't you mention it because it's not like when you use addition, it's not a homomorphism. Say that again? Like or if you use addition, is not what you said? Well, I'm saying right, definitely addition doesn't work, but if I only look at the product, for example, q q sorry, q without zero is a group with product. There's you there's inverses, it's associative, uh, it's even commutative. Uh so why don't I want to say that this is a homomorphism? I think there, well, is it right to say there's no linearity or you can't, um, you have to call it a group homomorphism to define the, the um, function or, 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 I forgot the name of it, function, like, you know, addition versus multiplication. In this case, you have to use multiplication because like you said, adding two primitive polynomials. Yeah, I mean, but a group, you know, for example, Q, you could think of the group with multiplication. You could think of the group structure with addition. You know, they're both groups, you know, they're different groups, but I can choose the convenient ones here. So here, clearly, we should just ignore the addition. But the multipli I'm saying, what I'm saying is the multiplication is not that great either. So what is not great about the multiplication here? on the domain. What don't I like about the domain? I guess you don't have a zero element in there. It does, it has an identity element, uh, which is the polynomial one. But what doesn't it have? Inverse. Uh, Inverses, right. Um, so really, you know, I would I would like to say that this is a homomorphism of groups, but they're not groups. Uh, the the domain is not a group. Is it only a field? It's not a field. It's a ring. Uh, I mean, it's a ring if I add zero. Um, So, you know, it's uh, what there's there's words for any sort of like combination of algebraic properties as a word. So this is probably a semi group, I think, is what you call a group with no inverses. But uh, who cares? So like, 
whatever this is, um, Arthur, let's Google it. Um, you might see in your life, like the definition of crap, like semi groups and monoids and stuff. There's probably a monoid then. But even if those definitions exist, groups are just a hundred times more important than any of those. Uh, so it's much more important to say that these are not groups than to say whatever they are. Okay. In any case, the multiplication is preserved much like with a group homomorphism, even if these are not groups. Uh, oh, Roy said there's no inverses. Um, Roy gets a point. Uh, okay. So let's let's prove it. Uh, the, pr the product of primitive polynomials is primitive. So suppose f and g are primitive. Uh, so I want to show that the product is primitive, of course. So the first property is clear. The coefficients are Uh, the coefficients are integers. And now the second property that the, the coefficients have no common factor, uh, that's uh, that's where the gist of everything is. So, okay, this is the hardest thing we're gonna do today. Um, okay, let me ask the hardest question I'll ask today. What, am I, what do I do here? How can I show that the, that the coefficients um, of the product are, are prime. What can I try? First thing that comes to mind for me is actually just multiplying them out, but that might take way too long. Right. I mean, so there is, a, there is an easier way, easier way. That is probably what I would try too, honestly, but I've, I've prepared for the class. So what we do is, so to show that there's no, common divisor, it's enough to show that there's no prime common divisor. So what we do is this very tricky thing that makes things very easy. Um, I mean, it makes things simple, like it makes it proof fast, but it's, it's sort of a cool idea. So suppose, actually, let's just, let's say P is a prime. It's not proof the it's proof like the proof forward and not um, by contradiction. I want to show that no prime divides everything. So what I know, I want to show P doesn't divide uh, the product of F times G. So I know um, I know f of x is not a multiple of p because otherwise everything would have a common factor of p and g of x is not a multiple of p. So what you want to do is reduce mod modulo p. So if, if f is um, some sum of some polynomial like this, um, take f to be just the polynomial that you get reducing mod p, meaning reducing all the coefficients. So, so this is a polynomial now with coefficients in a field. Um, <clears throat> and and for G, we can do the same thing and, and reduce it modulo P. So if F is not a multiple of P, what can I say about F hat? <clears throat> the reduction mod P.
some integer that's not zero? It's not zero, right, exactly. And similarly, G is not zero because, um, well, what you need to be zero is for not every coefficient to be zero. And, and this means that not every coefficient is zero mod P. So the polynomial is not zero. Now, if you multiply two things that are non-zero, uh, what you get is um, non-zero. So now I guess one thing we're using is that multiplying and reducing mod P commute with each other. This means that P doesn't divide f of x times g of x because its reduction is not zero. So what I've shown is that you take any prime and it doesn't divide every coefficient of the product. So is f times g primitive? Uh, the answer is yes. So I think the temptation, my temptation here definitely is um, multiplying everything out and trying to somehow stare at the formulas and, and show that things work. But actually, if you reduce mod P, the statement that the product of primitive is primitive is saying that if you multiply things that are not zero modulo P, you get not zero modulo P. Remember that we showed that over an integral domain, polynomials don't multiply to zero. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, so I have one minute, but I can prove lemma two because it's very easy with, uh, with what we know now. So lemma two says that the content multiplies much like a group homomorphism. So what we do is write F1 as the product of its content times a primitive polynomial, F2 as the product of its content times a primitive polynomial. And now you multiply them. So there's the product of two numbers times the product of two polynomials. So now by lemma one, this is primitive. So just chasing the definitions, um, I wrote the polynomial I want as the product of a rational number and a primitive polynomial. Uh, and, and what happens when you, when you write the polynomial as a product of a number times something primitive, this means that the content is that number that showed up. All right, that's it. Um, all right, uh, so. I'm done. Um, so if you if you just think about it, I'm sure you can figure out why now irreducible polynomials in, in Z are irreducible in Q and vice versa. But uh, I'll do it on Friday. All right.